Good morning, good morning. You may be seated. Does my bag match my outfit today? Special shout out to the San Jose campus. It's great to have you guys with us today. I'm over here in Santa Clara. Uh, but I expect a lot of excitement over at San Jose. You can't be quiet over there just because I'm not he there. I'm here. Who can say amen to this? I'm here. Amen. amen. It's good to have you guys today. So I got a question for you. What are you afraid of? What really, really scares you? This week, it's about dawn. So the sun is up, but it's not super bright outside yet. And uh, Robin's already out in the car. She's waiting for me. And I come out the back door, and we have a little porch in the back. And, and so I, I walk down the stairs, as, and as I'm heading to the car, something catches my attention out of the corner of my eye. And it's something that registers in my brain that it's not quite right because I recognize it to be a spider just like two feet from my face. And so I jump back kind of like this, and I notice it's not one of those little eatsy beatsy spiders that come up the pipe, all right? I'm talking about a spider about, well, it's about maybe a silver dollar, all right? And it's kind of hairy, and it's scary, and it's suspended in the, in the middle of the, the air. And so I yell for Robin, Robin, come and get this thing. No, that's not what I said. I, I happened to have a shoe with me because I wasn't wearing my shoes. I had some flip-flops on. And, and I walked on over there, and I noticed this elaborate web system that was set up between two wires that went from a pole to my house. And, and there was this huge cop, this web. And, and he was kind of suspended in the middle of the air coming to get something. I knock him out of the air, and I go and I step on him. And, and I think that the situation settled there. But how many of you are afraid of spiders? Just a little bit. Just a little bit afraid of spiders. Ah, I can't stand them. Long time ago, before most of you were born, there was a song that came out, I Don't Like Spiders and Snakes. And I went on the internet this week, and I looked up uh, what is it that we're all afraid of. And, and most people, their number one fear is either spiders, snakes, or public speaking. Those are the things that just get most people. Those are the things that, that make us a little squeamish. But there were millions of web pages on fears. It just shocked me. People are afraid of things like clowns, ghosts, zombies, closets, enclosed spaces, germs, heights. And then, like in the last 20 or 30 years, there's this whole new thing that they, they talk about on the news all the time. There's terrorism, there's cyber crimes, there's identity theft, then the, the ancient old political corruption. People are afraid of the economy collapsing. We're afraid of bio-warfare now. We had a president many, many years ago who said this, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I think he hit the nail on the head. And the reason I, I think that is because of our Savior, Jesus. In the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he gives like 150 imperative statements or 150 challenges to his disciples. So that means there's a, 150 challenges to you and I. And he says that we should love each other eight times. That's, that's one of the top commands, love. Love your neighbor, love, love your enemy, uh, love people as you love yourself. But the number one command of Jesus was do not be afraid. 21 different times, just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it says don't be afraid. One person searched the scriptures in between do not be afraid and fear not and, and cheer up and be of good courage. They found 365 admonitions not to fear. That's one for every single day. So with that, I want to read to you from Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 5 and following, and you're going to see some of the devil's scare tactics in this particular chapter. You're going to see how he wants to overwhelm you with fear, 
how he wants to intimidate you by telling you not to do something that you're planning to do right now. He wants to control your behavior through fear because whatever you fear is what controls you. So let's read the scripture. The fifth time Sanballat's servant came with an open letter in his hand. And this is what it said. Geshem tells me that everywhere he goes, he hears that the Jews are planning to rebel and that it is you that are building the wall. He claims you plan to be their king. That is what he is being said about you anyway. He also reports that you've appointed prophets to campaign for you at Jerusalem by saying, look, Nehemiah is just the man we need. You can be very sure that I'm going to pass along these interesting comments to King Artaxerxes. I suggest that you come and talk it over with me, for that is the only way you can save yourself. My reply was, you know you're lying. There isn't one bit of truth to the whole story. Uh, the, the Hebrew translation actually says, you're inventing this in your own head. Verse 9, you're just trying to scare. Say scare. scare. Say scare. scare. You're just trying to scare us into stopping our work. So he stops here and he prays, Oh Lord, please strengthen me. Please strengthen my hands. Verse 10, a few days later I went to visit Shemaiah, for he said he was receiving a message from God. Let us hide in the temple and bolt the door, he exclaimed, for they are coming tonight to kill you. I replied, Should I, the governor, run away from danger? And if I go into the temple, see, this word for temple here is the inner sanctum. It's the place that only the priest should go into. And the penalty, according to the Bible, was death. So he says, should I go into the temple not being a priest? I would forfeit my life. No, I won't do it. Then I realized that God had not spoken to him, but Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him to scare me and to make me sin by fleeing to the temple. And then they would be able to accuse me. Oh my God, I prayed. Don't forget all the evil of Tobiah, Sanballat, Noadiah, and the prophetess, and all the other prophets who've tried to discourage me. The wall was finally finished in September, just 52 days after we had begun. And when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened. You guys see how the tables are turned here? They're trying to scare us. They're trying to scare us. They're trying to scare us. We finish what it is God has asked us to do. This is the message God is trying to communicate right now, that you have something God wants you to do. When you finish it, the tables are going to be turned in Jesus' name. And they realized, it said, that the work had been done with the help of our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we're just asking that you would do a miracle in our hearing today. We're asking you, Father God, to expand our understanding of Scripture. And we're asking you, Father God, to do something in our soulish realm, in our spirit man, Father God, to defeat every single fear that is deep within us, to, to uncover them and to heal them and to remove them and give us victory today, we pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. And together, everyone on both campuses says, Amen, amen and Amen. And amen. Today I've only got two points. Point number one is no fear. And point number two is no fear. Except they're not the same point. The first one is K-N-O-W, no fear, understand fear. The second point is if you properly understand what is okay to fear and what you shouldn't fear, then there will be no of that, none of that harmful fear in your lives or N-O, fear. So, the first thing we need to understand is that there are some good fears. Did you know that? Did anybody know that there are good things to be afraid of? That, that fear can actually be a gift from God. Because it is an ability or a sense to perceive danger in your lives. Now, here on this campus, this isn't really something to be afraid of, and nor on the, on the Bethel San Jose campus. But, but if you go to the edge of the platform, and I just want you to imagine with me, okay? Imagine that this is a 1,000-foot drop-off right here. Now, how many of you would stand this close to the edge of a 1,000-foot drop-off? Any, anybody? Who would be a little nervous about this? Be honest. You'd be a little nervous. 
I would be. I mean, if you're not nervous standing at the edge of a 1,000-foot cliff, there's something wrong with you. This is called common sense. God has placed a, a preservation instinct on the inside of us so that if something like this happens, we get a little afraid. And so what we do is we back away from it. Now, you can train yourself not to be afraid of this. You can become a mountain climber, and, and you can train yourself not to be afraid to a certain degree. But most of us naturally are afraid of that. Let me give you another example. Let's say you are at uh, the zoo. And while you're at the zoo, you're looking at the elephants, and all of a sudden, over the intercom system, uh, would everyone please start making their way to the exits? The lions have all ex you know, escaped their cages. How would you feel? Would you be a little apprehensive all of a sudden? I, I mean, I, I'd start going, kids, come on, you know, Robin, let, let's go. And, and, and we'd start looking for a way out, and we'd start walking down this aisle, let's say, and if a lion started coming and approaching me, I, I probably wouldn't say, here, kitty, kitty, here, kitty, kitty. That's not the first thought that would go through my mind. What would go through my mind is, let's get out of Dodge. Let's run. And, and I wouldn't be considered a coward. I'd be considered smart for grabbing my kids, grabbing my wife, and going out a different exit so that the, the professionals could take care of this. It's called a, a self-preservation instinct. It's a, a healthy fear, a good fear. Now, what you can do with this is you can have some fun with some people, right? Have you ever scared another human being by, by saying boo? Have you ever hid in the closet, and then as they walk by, you just open up the closet ah, and, scare, and scare them half to death? It's kind of funny. Now, I did that this morning by accident with my wife. Sorry, Robin. It was an accident because uh, yesterday at our event, uh, somebody had this big, ugly thing on their motorcycle, and I asked him if I could see it. So I grabbed this thing... Somebody's afraid of it, and they didn't, it's not even real here, okay? Now, you guys see this thing? Is this ugly or what? I mean, this is just one of the most disgusting-looking things here. So let me, let me get it out here. And so let me tell you what happened this morning. I grabbed this yesterday, and, and let's say my office is this platform right here. And what I did is, is I placed the, the little creature, the little critter, right there, all right? And uh, my door to my office is right there. And so I called up my wife, and, and she was going to get me some oatmeal from McDonald's this morning. So she gets me the oatmeal, and it's still dark outside. She opens up my door, and she comes around like this, and that thing's staring her straight in the eye. She jumped back about 11 feet, and, and have you ever heard the phrase, scared me half to death? She lost the color in her face. She was like screaming, and she's looking at the thing, and, and she still, re she recognizes it as not real, and yet she's still like hyperventilating a little bit. It's, you know, that thing's scary looking. This is okay. You didn't do anything wrong, Robin. It's called good, healthy fear. But there's a bad fear out there. The scripture tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. There is a fear that goes beyond the normal into the spiritual realm, and, and it is an exaggeration sometimes of what is normal and natural. It's no longer beneficial. It becomes bad. You've probably heard the phrase, Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. All they're saying is don't exaggerate the reality of the problem. I read a story this week about a, a hunter. And I know Pastor uh, Matt Blankenship is a, is a hunter on our staff. And, and he enjoys going out there and, and shooting himself a, a turkey or a deer. And, and that's what this guy did. He would hunt on a regular basis. Pheasant hunting, elk hunting, um, a wild boar hunting. He did all of these things. And one day he was reading an article on Lyme disease. And it says that Lyme disease is, is given or, or received through wood ticks. 
And he remembered that the last time he had gone hunting, he had got all these ticks all over him, and his wife helped pick some of them off, but they had actually gotten connected to him. So he rushed to his doctor, and he demanded a blood test. He said, I want to know if I've got Lyme disease. And the doctor tested him, and, and he had no Lyme disease. As a matter of fact, he had no symptoms whatsoever. But the man was consumed by his fear. And so he, he studied on the internet, he read books, and, and he was convinced that he had Lyme disease so much that he started exhibiting actual symptoms of Lyme disease. He went to the doctor again. They did tests again. No Lyme disease. He went and got a second opinion. Again, no Lyme disease. This went on for two years until finally he couldn't take it any longer, and he killed himself because he thought he had Lyme disease. This is a, an irrational fear, an exaggeration of the reality. It, it's, it's the enemy of our soul tricking our minds into believing something that just isn't true. I'm going to ask another question. Does anybody out here get the heebie-jeebies when they fly? You know, it just kind of feels a little weird. There's a lot of people who have a fear of flying. You understand that, right? But again, it's not a rational fear. It doesn't make sense rationally speaking, and why I say that is you have a 1 in 11 million chance of dying. I'm going to get rid of the spider, all right? <laughs> you have a 1 in 11 million chance of dying in an airplane crash. You have a 1 in 5,000 chance of dying in an automobile wreck. You have a bigger chance of dying driving to the airport than flying to New York City. That's just the reality. So being afraid of flying doesn't make sense. What also doesn't make sense is all of these stars in, in the media who, who are afraid of the weirdest things. It seems to me that the, the more money people make and, and, and the more fame they get, the more things they're afraid of. Howard Hughes, the, the, the guy who, who pretty much built uh, Las Vegas and was a, one of the first billionaires, he was afraid of, of just about anything. The last five or eight years of his life, he wouldn't even leave his hotel room because he was so afraid. Scarlett Johansson, who's supposed to be a Marvel superhero character, she's afraid of birds like sparrows and, and pigeons. Megan Fox is afraid of the dark. Oprah Winfrey is afraid of chewing gum. Chewing gum. I, I'm, I'm like, what in the world? And so we don't want to call them fears. We don't want to be embarrassed. So what, what the medical community does is they call them phobias. So Wimfra has chiclophobia. <laughs> Chiclets, I guess. So chiclophobia. Uh, some people have ephibophobia. Anybody here have ephibophobia? Any teenagers here? No teenagers in the house? Oh, there's a couple of teenagers? Ephibophobia is fear of teenagers. <laughs> so, so, ah! Oh, no, I, I, I'm not afraid. Uh, here, here's one. Anuptophobia, a fear of staying single. Arachibutophobia, fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. Now, was anybody here last week? Let me see. You were here last week. Okay. And the reason I asked is last week I kind of threw my mother-in-law under the bus, if you guys remember. I, I was talking about some stuff that she had at home and, and that we shouldn't love our stuff so much. And, and I was pretty confident that she wasn't going to watch the message last week. <laughs> she watched. And she texted and uh, let us know how she felt about that. And I now have pentherophobia, which is fear of your mother-in-law, just so you know. Uh, it, it, this is what the scripture says in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. Adoption, some translations say. If you're a Christian, there is no need for you to ever fear again. God has given you freedom. He sets you free. He's given you a key to open the door of everything that binds you and locks you in. And you can be set free today in the name of Jesus Christ. So this is what I want you to do. I, I'm free. You're free. So I want you to say that. I am free. Let's do it. I am free. One more time. I am free. 
So I, I don't know what that could be. You, you can be fear, free of your fear of man. You can be free of, of drugs and alcohol. You can be free of, of your fear of failure. Whatever it is, you're free today in Jesus' name. But understand, that doesn't mean the temptation won't come. Last week, we said that, that one of the things that the enemy does is tempts us to do things that are against God's will. God doesn't want you to be afraid, but he's going to tempt you to be afraid. Why? Because he wants to stop your progress. Verse 9 says this, you're just trying to scare us into stopping the work. You're just trying to get me to, to stop. You're trying to, to paralyze me. See, if he can stop you, he can, he can paralyze your, your church ministry. He can paralyze even the, the progress you're making in your marriage. He can paralyze the progress you're making in your family. Sometimes we make a decision, you know what, I, I know I should make the first move, but, but what if they don't respond? So you're paralyzed. You're afraid that you're not going to get the response that you want to receive from God. So you don't do anything. There are bridges all across the world. And we have a lot of them right here in the Bay Area. The Golden Gate Bridge, the Bay Bridge, the, the Dunbarton Bridge. Did you know there are times when people get right up to the edge of the bridge and they just stop and they can't move any further? Right here in our own Bay Area. All across the United States of America, they have something called timid motorist programs to help people. If they get so scared they can't cross the bridge, a guy will come and drive your car across the bridge for you. This is common. On one bridge the, in the Chesapeake Bay area, one guy drives 6,000 people across the bridge every day, and he's just one of three services in that area. This is a real fear because people are so paralyzed by their fear. Now, now there's another alternative. Rather than being paralyzed, some people just panic and run the other direction. They're not paralyzed. They run. Verse 11, should I, this is what Nehemiah says, the governor, run away from danger? Should I run away? Should I run away from the challenge? Should, should I run away from the possibility that maybe something might go wrong someday in the future? You know, they've actually studied worries, and they found that 90-some percent of the things we worry about never come to pass. Think of that. Could you imagine if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that nine out of every ten things you worried about don't ever happen? Would you try more? Would you do more? Would you have more confidence? You should have it in the name of Jesus Christ. Fear just robs you. It steals from you. It, it takes away friendships, opportunities, your future. I, I remember as a teenage boy, I was so afraid of asking anybody out on a date because I thought I might be rejected. I thought they might say no. But you know what? If you never ask, they can never say yes. If you never ask, you will never know. So fear is an attack on your soul. It's an attack on your spirit man. And I found something really, really interesting in the book of Nehemiah. I want you to think about it. If you've been here for a couple of weeks now, you know we've been studying Nehemiah chapter 1 through 6. We're finishing 6 today. We've had eight different messages on this book. And I want you to think about it up to this point. Has the enemy attacked Nehemiah yet up to this point? Even one time. Has there been one battle, one war, anything? The answer is no. In six chapters, over the course of two months, there have been a lot of threats. There's been some innuendo. There's been a lot of intimidation. And then it dawned on me. One of the greatest weapons at the enemy's disposal is nothing more than their words. Nothing more than a, a verbal assault. The scripture tells us in the Proverbs that words are like a piercing sword. That they can stab, that they can injure, that they can hurt. One of the worst advices that my parents ever gave me was this. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. You guys remember that one? That's the worst advice in the world. Words are deadly. Words are powerful. And here's the reason why. Words are spiritual. Did you know that? Jesus in John chapter 6 verse 63 says, My words are spirit. And then he articulates and clarifies. He says, and my words are truth. 
So Jesus' words are spirit, but everything he spoke was always truth. So that meant every word that came out of his mouth built. Every word that came out of his mouth was constructive. Every word that came out of his mouth was good. But other people, your words are spiritual also. How do I know this? Because life and death are in the power of the tongue. You can kill. You can assassinate. You can ruin a reputation just with your words. Because they're more than words. They're spiritual. And sometimes they kill. Sometimes they produce death. If you look in the book of Nehemiah, just these first couple of chapters, there's a number of ways that the enemy tried to defeat Nehemiah. In chapter 2, he ridiculed Nehemiah. Let me ask a simple question. In all of your memory banks, can you ever remember someone making fun of you? And how did it make you feel? I can think back to when I was a kid, people teasing me because I was so short. I was the shortest kid in class from about first grade through ninth grade. And in ninth grade, I finally started growing a little bit. But I I remember the pain that was inflicted upon my soul because people would call me midget and shorty and runt, and and, and they thought it was funny. In in the King James Bible, uh, Nehemiah 2.19 actually says, they laughed us to scorn. They were laughing. They weren't laughing with you. They were laughing at you. And if you remember those experiences, you remember the pain of that. Number two, insults. In chapter four, it says, you feeble Jews. Two things happening right here, name calling and ethnic slurs. They're they're, they're using ethnic slurs to demean, to to make uh, everyone else think, "Well, well, they're lower than. Feeble, they're calling into question their strength, their ability, their might. Have you ever been called ugly, stupid, dumb, jerk, loser? Any of these names that people so easily throw out, especially in elementary school, especially in junior high and high school, those words flow sometimes. And and everyone laughs. And and even the person who who they're directed at laughs, but it's not funny to them inside. There is something breaking deep down inside. There is something being injured on the inside. And we need to understand that the devil is at work. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The enemy is not that person. It's not that girl. It's not that guy. The enemy is the devil himself. And he's trying to plant seeds of doubt into your humanity. He's trying to make you think that you're less than. I heard a story about name-calling recently. Um, a little boy was being tucked into bed by his mother, and there was a storm outside, and, and so she just gets ready to leave, and, and he says, Mommy, can you sleep with me tonight? I, I'm scared. And Mom says, No, 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 I've got to sleep with your, your father tonight. And she starts walking out the door, and he responds, The big sissy. <laughs> Here's one that we use a lot, sarcasm. Sarcasm is used in chapter 4 to demean and diminish the Jewish people. Nehemiah. I I mean, this is what they say. They ask this question. Will they finish the wall in a day? Do you understand what's going on here? There had been no wall rebuilt for over 100 years. 90 years previously, the Jews were were allowed to come back and to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the wall. It tells us in Ezra, they started rebuilding the wall and they were stopped, the scripture says, because they were made to fear, so they stopped. 13 years before, they show up again. They get another opportunity to rebuild the wall and they're stopped again. Now Nehemiah shows up. Up, and what are they doing? They're planting seeds of doubt. You failed in the past. You're going to fail again. We, we've never done it that way before. You can't do it. You've been a loser your entire life. Some of you, you might be thinking, you know what? I've, I've never got the victory over this before. I'm probably not going to get it now. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You can have the victory today in Jesus' name. That's what he desires is to liberate us from our fears in Jesus' name. <laughs> Gossip. There's another one. You know what saddens a pastor's heart? Is when Christians talk about each other. It really saddens my heart when we we talk about our brothers and sisters in the Lord. When we talk about leadership. When we talk about people in, in demeaning ways. 
I mean, I want you to look at, at Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 6. It says this in the NIV. I'm going to change the translation here a bit. It says, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true. Isn't that how gossip works? Well, did you hear about so-and-so? And by the way, I get this from a very reliable source. Who cares how reliable the source is? Do you know human nature at all? If you know human nature, you know people will exaggerate what they're saying in the moment to make themselves look better. That's how we are as human beings. One lady says, yeah, yeah, pastor, I agree with you. If I don't have anything to good to say, I don't say it at all. But what I've got now is really, really good. No, 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 that's gossip. We don't need to hear that kind of stuff. Verse 10 talks about lies, you know. And I, I'm thinking, I, I don't know if you noticed, but if you read those first couple verses again, it says that they hand out an unsealed letter. Back then, the, the practice was to, to put the letter together. It was a parchment. You rolled it up, and then you put your seal on the outside so you know no one else has read it. They unsealed it on purpose. They wanted the world to read the accusations that were being made. And it dawned on me, all that was was a precursor to Facebook. It was Facebook back 3,000 years ago. Because all they were doing was, was letting the world read what they felt, what they thought. I've got a question for you. Are we supposed to be Christians online as well as offline? If we're supposed to be Christians all the time, we need to understand that by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. There no, are no excuses for berating, belittling, being mean-spirited people online. I think Yelp should go out of business, to be quite honest. I, I'm just here to tell you, the nature of man is such that we are more likely to complain when things go bad than praise when things go good. So whatever you see on these ratings online, understand you need to multiply the good by about tenfold just to truly understand what the rating really is. Be careful about those things because the enemy works on your imagination. He starts throwing arrows and darts and swords right here. The battle is in the mind. The battle is in the thought processes. In the mind is where you will be challenged to doubt and to fear and to do all these things. And, and, and this is why it starts getting really, really bad. Because bad fear actually sickens the entire environment. The entire team can be sick with fear. You guys remember the story of the 12 spies going into the promised land? They came back out and 10 said, oh no, they're too scary. Two said, we can do it, we can do it. But ten said, it's too scary. And two million people gave up because of the report of ten. This happened in my own life. I've lived this. When I was a child, I was, I was innocent. I, I didn't know that, that just because my mom was afraid, I didn't have to be afraid. I took upon myself all of her fears. She was afraid to go out of the house. She was afraid of what people thought. She was afraid of failing. For, for a three-year period in her life, she, she almost never left the house at all. She had us do everything for her. Well, those fears jumped on me. That spirit invaded my soul. And, and until I was about 28 to 30 years of age, I had to fight that every single day of my life. At one point, I was the sales manager of a paint company, and I was too afraid to make sales calls. Think about it. My job was to not only make sales calls, but, but to train people and to help people make sales calls. And I was too afraid to do it. Because there was a spirit of fear in my life. And that spirit will always, say always, it'll always lead you to sin. It's probably sin in and of itself, not the temptation, but the more you entertain that idea, it starts becoming sin in your life. And, and then the scripture says that, that he's challenged to run into the temple. That was a sin. Not, not the church, to, to the holy place where only the priest was supposed to go. He was being tempted to violate the word of God just to protect himself. This is what I need you to know. 
that God has turned a lot of cowards into conquerors. He took Moses and made him a miracle worker. He took Gideon and and he became a great general. He took a hesitant Jonah and and led a whole city to, to, to know God. He took one of the disciples by the name of Peter, and I love to call him Chicken Peter because he he was always running away from what God wanted him to do until he was baptized with the Holy Spirit and everything changed. He went from a coward to a conqueror in Jesus' name. And that can be true of any of us. So in order for us to to have no fear, we have to first of all know fear, and then we have to actually do something that sounds counterintuitive, and that is to fear God. If you don't want any fear in your life, if you want to live victoriously, if you want to be more than a conqueror, then you should fear God. And you might say, that that doesn't make sense. I don't want to have any fear in my life. But, But listen to what Scripture says. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, this is Jesus. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. In in other words, never be afraid of man. Never be afraid of a boss. Never be afraid of a spouse. Never be afraid of anyone. Yes, it might. Physical pain we don't want. There's that natural fear not to experience that. But I'm talking about that spirit of fear here. It doesn't ever need to elevate to that degree. But fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, there is a a being, his name is God, who's going to judge every single action that has ever taken place on this planet. And you can trust him. He's, yes, he's scary and intimidating in one way. He's scary and intimidating in the fact that that he created the entire universe. He's scary and intimidating because he's more powerful than a a nuclear reactor. And I wouldn't want to get too close to a nuclear reactor. He's scary and intimidating because with his spoken word, he created the universe and the sun and the planets and the animals, and he created you and me. And so anything that's that powerful, Powerful. There is a, an intimidation associated with it. Oswald Chambers said this, when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas when you do not fear God, you fear everything else. And that's what I see. I see people afraid of everything. Now, they say they're not. They act like, oh, well, I'm all this. A lot of times, the, the more courageous and bold people act, the more scared they really are on the inside. The more braggadocious they are, the more arrogant they are. That, that's just a, a veneer. That's just a mask to cover up what's really going on deep down in their hearts. Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want to be wise? Fear the Lord. Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to be smart? Fear the Lord. Proverbs 14.27, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Do you want life? Fear the Lord. Because once you start getting this relationship in proper perspective, it starts growing faith in God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Anything that is not of faith, the scripture says, is sin. So we need to have faith in the one and the only true God. A mom was in the kitchen and she was rearranging some stuff and a, and a pitcher fell out of the tap cabinet and, and it shattered on the floor. And she knew her normal kitchen broom wouldn't do the job, but she had one of those commercial things up in the attic. So she grabbed her eight-year-old son, and she said, would you go get the, the big broom up in the attic? And so he goes, sure, Mom. And, and so he goes over, and there's this little rope hanging down, and he pulls the rope, and some stairs come down. And he starts climbing on up there, and right when he gets to the top, there's a clap of thunder. And it shocks him just a little bit. And, 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 and he looks around, and he notices how dark it is up in the attic and how smelly it is up in the attic. And and right when he pokes his head through, there's some cobwebs that go across his face. And and he panics and he runs down the stairs and he goes back to his mom and he says, it's too scary up there. It's too scary up there. And she goes, come on, son. She says, God's going to be up there with you. There's nothing to be afraid of. And so he he goes on over and he confronts the stairs again. And and he starts walking up those stairs. and, and, And he moves some of the cobwebs aside and he sticks up his head and he says, hey, God, if you're up here, would you hand me the broom, please? We laugh, but if you really have faith in God, you can do anything, anything. The disciples were on a stormy sea one day, and Jesus was sleeping in the boat. And I want you to think about this. The God I just described, 
the God who's all-powerful, the God who made the ocean, the God who made the Sea of Galilee, the God who, who made the, the materials to make that boat, the God who made the wind that was starting to, to frighten all of the, the men in, in that boat, uh, he's sleeping right there with them. He's living life with them. He's walking through life with them. And all of a sudden, they start getting afraid of the storm. And they panic, and they wake Jesus up and say, Jesus, we're all going to die. And his first words are, why are you so afraid? You of little faith. You might say, Pastor, how do we grow our faith? Spend more time with God. Get, I'm, I'm telling you, have faith in God. Focus on who he is. Sarah Blankenship here earlier this week told me that when her kids are afraid, sometimes they won't reason. And so she has to go over and she has to grab their little heads and just hold them and say, look at me. Have any of you done that with your children before? I've had kids who were so afraid that, that I, had to, I had to grab them. I had to say, look at me. I'm bigger than the spider. I, I, I'm bigger than the snake. I can get the boogeyman out of your life. I can protect you. I, I can save you, but you got to look at me. What does that feel like as a Christian? Nehemiah is the perfect book for it. Starts with fasting and prayer. If you want to look at God, Start fasting. Start spending time in prayer. It's punctuated almost every chapter with Nehemiah praying something. I read this this week. This is not my own. Courage is nothing more than fear that has said its prayers. Did you see this in verse 9? He's scared to death. What you're saying is trying to scare me. And then he stops and he says, Lord, would you strengthen my hands? Lord, would you give me strength? Courage is nothing more than fear that has said its prayers. And then you've got to hear a word from God. The only way you can hear a word from God is by reading his word, studying his word, understanding his word. I, I read this story about a, a woman, and she gave birth to a little baby who had bad kidneys. And the doctors told her that the baby was going to die. And so her and her husband started praying right after delivery. Started praying. She got out her Bible. She started reading her Bible. And after a couple of hours, she stumbled across this verse in John eleven four: 4. This sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory. She looked at her husband and she said, this is for us. This is for our, our son. He's not going to die. And the husband's a little hesitant, you know. He's like, well, you know, that was a specific promise for, for that, you know, person. And she goes, no, no, this is God's word for us today. And sure enough, a uh, a couple of weeks later, they're able to take the baby home. But it's not an easy journey. Thirteen years, he has to come back to the hospital on a regular basis, dialysis, all kinds of issues and problems. And finally, the doctors say his kidneys have failed completely. Uh, we need a, a transplant or he's going to die. Of course, the mom's a perfect match. She gives him one of her kidneys, and they both live. He lives a prosperous life. Why? She had a vision. The vision was based on a promise that was found in the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 very clearly says, God has not given you the spirit of fear. If you're afraid, it doesn't come from God in any way, shape, or form. But He's given you the spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Power that can never say never can never be defeated, love that cannot be disheartened, a sound mind that can never be disturbed in the name of Jesus Christ. So it is our job to make sure that the things that get into our mind are filtered appropriately in the name of Jesus Christ. What am I saying? Romans tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Fear comes by hearing and hearing by the word of anything that is not of God. Does that make any sense to anybody? If you want faith, you have to filter everything through the Word. It's got to be Bible, 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 Bible. If you want fear, turn on the news. If you want fear, listen to discouraging people. If you want fear, listen to the negativity that surrounds us every single day. There's plenty of that all around the world. Fear fills the world in which we live, but it doesn't have to fill your heart. 
doesn't have to fill your heart. It's knocking on the door every single day. You do not have to invite it in. Just say no. What you're saying is a lie. That's what Nehemiah said. No. What you're saying is a lie. The word of God is true. I want you to listen. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 33 and 34. Who through faith, this is what you can do through faith. Who through faith conquered kingdoms. Who through faith administered justice. Who through faith gained what was promised. Who through faith shut the mouths of lions. Who through faith quenched the fury of the flames. Who through faith escaped the edge of the sword. Who through faith whose weakness was turned into strength. And who through faith they became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the promise that God has for every single one of you today. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And as you stand on both campuses, I'm asking you to face the thing that you are most afraid of right now. I'm asking you to admit to God what it is and to confront it head on in the name of Jesus Christ. Understand, the battle's right here. See, if the devil wins this battle, he wins your heart. He wins control of, of what you're going to do in your life and the direction that you're going to go. If he loses this battle, God controls your heart. And you can stand and you can do anything. So as we close, these are some things that God told me to announce. Some of you have been too afraid of joining a life group because you feel awkward about walking into a house with people that you don't know or coming to the church with people that you don't know, God is challenging you to stand against your fear today and join a life group in Jesus' name. There are people in this house that are too afraid to tithe. It's not that they don't want to tithe. They appreciate what goes on here. But there has been a hesitation, a fear that there won't be enough in the future if I tithe today. And God is saying, you can still tithe today. Find an usher, find a pastor, and write out that check. Do it online. Do it today in Jesus' name. There are some of you who are afraid to forgive somebody in your life. You're afraid to forgive an ex-spouse. You're afraid to forgive your parents because your parents have been the reason why you act the way you do. And if you truly forgive mom and dad, God's going to require you to live differently in Jesus' name. And he's saying, let him go. Let go that fear. Some of you have never read or prayed in public or spoken in public. God wants you to do it in Jesus' name. Some of you are afraid of accepting Jesus Christ because you think it'll cost too much. It's the best decision you're ever going to make. Some have never been water baptized. Even you know, no, that's what you should do. You should do it this next month in Jesus' name. Why? Because you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Amen? Finally, finish the work. Finish what it is God's calling you to do. Some of you are getting ready to do something within the next couple of days. You're, you're not just going to start it. You're going to finish it in Jesus' name. So some of you have been planning. I, I, I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to go this particular direction. Finish it in Jesus' name. God wants us to finish our Christian walk strong. It doesn't matter if you're 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 years of age. Finish your Christian walk strong in Jesus' name. The impossible was accomplished in 52 days. Does that make sense to anybody? Here's a gate or a wall that was down for almost 150 total years. And nobody believed it could be done. And they finished it in 52 days. And then the scripture tells us that all the fear that was directed at them was turned on their enemies. And the enemies were frightened. The enemies were humiliated. And the enemies recognized that God had done something in their lives. I just want to rehash real quickly the gates that have been built here through our messages in the last eight weeks. Gate number one is the sheep gate. Everyone needs to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Gate number two was grow track. We're getting everyone on this discipleship track. It's one of the gates that we're finished. Gate number three was give and go. It's, it's our commitment to missions. That's never going to end. It, it's continuing. 
Uh, gate number four is what you saw yesterday on both campuses. For the first time ever, we had a community outreach on both campuses that reached thousands of people. And like 200 young children accepted Jesus Christ for the very first time. That's what's happening at Bethel. And there's another gate that's going to be built on November the 9th at 7.30 p.m. at Trianon Theater in downtown San Jose. And if you don't know where that's at, it's at 5th Street right across from City Hall. It's an ideal location, and we're launching our heart and soul ministry. If you're between the ages of 18 and 35 or thereabouts... I'm encouraging you to show up for this launch date because it is another gate. It's another tower that's being built into the mission at Bethel, which is to go into all the world and make disciples. These are things that God is doing in our midst. You're a part of a church that has so much happening. But as you bow your heads right now, I just want to ask you for a, a confession if there's a fear in your life that you need God to take care of, would you just raise your hand and say, God, I don't want to be afraid any longer. If there's something that you're afraid of, something that you're thinking about doing, something that you know you should do, something that has been hanging around since childhood, raise your hand and say, God, I don't want this fear in my life any longer in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you see hands all across this place. And Father God, even if we haven't raised our hands, uh, we probably could acknowledge some things that, that sneak up every now and then. Almost like that spider shocked my, my wife in my office this morning. There are things that we think that we've dealt with from our past that seem to, to sneak up on us again and again and again. But in this moment today, Father God, we've heard your word very clearly. We've heard your instruction. We've heard your, your promise that you've not given us the spirit of fear. So, Father God, I pray that every single man and woman and every young person, Father God, in this house, in the name of Jesus Christ, will be delivered from all fears today in Jesus' name. I pray that we would have victory. I pray, Father God, that, that the waves and the wind that are swirling around us will be calmed by the voice of Jesus Christ today in our midst in Jesus' name. So I pray, Father God, that you'd grow our faith. I pray that you'd grow our understanding. I pray, Father God, that we'd have an understanding of what healthy fear is and an understanding of what bad fear is and that we would no longer live in that unhealthy, unspiritual type stuff any longer in Jesus' name. But that, Father God, we would trust you, that we would listen to your word, that we would follow your instruction, and that we would do everything that we can, Father God, because we know that you'll do the rest. We know that you will heal. We know that you'll restore. We know that you'll remove all that negativity from us and just mend our hearts and mend our souls and mend our minds and give us the strength and the boldness and the courage to do everything you've called us to do. I pray this today in Jesus' holy and precious name. And together everyone says...